We can be the generation that ends the opioid epidemic. We can do it. US President Donald Trump declares the opioid addiction a public health emergency. But how can the country stop it? Hello, I'm Nathan King, sitting in for Anand Naidu, and this is The Heat. Hello again. More than 11 million Americans misused prescription pain medicine last year, according to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration in the US. To discuss what the government can do to reduce that number, we welcome Dr. Andrew Kolodny, co-director of the Opioid Policy Research Institute from Brandeis University. He joins us from New York. Also here with us in the studio is Dr. Matthew Fogg, a retired Chief Deputy Marshal and former DEA agent. Marissa Vitali joins us from the West Coast, Los Angeles. She is an actress, writer and producer and a former heroin addict. And here in the studio, our own Sean Calebs. Sean, I'd like to start with you. You know, we, we've talked offset about this a lot. You are from Huntington, West Virginia, and you've spent several months, in most of last year actually, creating this really hard-hitting documentary called Hometown Heroin, where you went to your hometown and literally witnessed all this up close. What can you tell us from your journey about the opioid epidemic in this town, but also in America? It was a real learning experience, and it really began uh, with uh, during the presidential race. We were up in the New England area and came across just what a problem it was. I began doing research, and there were an area circle on the map that were the big problems. And right in the middle of the worst problem was my hometown of Huntington, West Virginia. I called friends to find out, look, is this as bad as people say? And they said, no, it's worse. And it's awful. You're talking about a hospital where one-third of the babies in the major town are born addicted to opioids. I talked to a number of my friends. Virtually every family, every family had somebody tied to this, whether it be a, an uncle, an aunt, a son, son-in-law. Uh, it was simply horrible. But we really profiled a handful of people, including a young girl uh, who was 23 at the time, Danielle Utt. She became addicted to opioids after undergoing surgery. She was given very powerful painkillers for uh, ar arguably something she did not need them for. She got hooked on heroin. It was very difficult for her to get off. She wanted to tell her story. She and her mother provided us with video of the young girl staggering around uh, high on heroin. And it was just a very sobering experience to go through this. And we want to show you just a bit about uh, what we encountered uh, during our time in West Virginia. Danielle grew up a good student with lots of friends, not the kind of person one might think who would get hooked on heroin. I was really against drugs altogether. Like, I did not like drugs at all. Like, I would not talk to somebody if they did a little tiny pain pill. Like, I would freak out. But before Danielle was out of her teens, life changed dramatically. Actually, I found out I was pregnant the day after I graduated high school with my daughter. So how did this working-class young woman go from a loving mother and serious student to a full-blown heroin addict? Her path to addiction is a familiar story in the United States. After the birth of her son, Danielle developed an ulcer. Doctors gave her powerful opioid pain medication. How long did it take you to get hooked on those pain pills? Not long. Not long at all. I wasn't hurting anymore, but I had it in my head that I was, like, my stomach still hurt and stuff, and so I thought I needed the medicine, but I really, I really was, I didn't need it, I wanted it, and then, then next thing I know, like, I caught, I like found myself like needing them every day, all day long. It's not uncommon to see first responders in Huntington assist overdose victims from the brush near the Ohio River. It's one place for users to get high. Doctors writing millions of prescriptions for opioids help fuel a U.S. crisis, a generation of junkies involving hundreds of thousands of people. I can tell you I've stayed in touch with Danielle. She is clean to this day. And her daughter, Skylar, who was born addicted to opioids and had to spend several months uh, being treated, she's doing well, but it is too early to tell if she's going to have some of the illnesses, some of the effects that come with that, learning disorders, uh, attention deficit. 
uh, but we do keep in touch with her. She has broken things off with her boyfriend. He did slip. He's back on drugs. You can watch the half-hour special Hometown Heroin at our website, america.cgtn.com. Nathan? Uh, Sean, thanks so much for sharing with us that. And it really is worth uh, to watch the whole thing because it really is good. Uh, I want to bring in Dr. Andrew uh, Kolodny here. Um, Sean's documentary showed in sort of a microcosm uh, what's been happening. But how do we get here in the United States? Because I think it's worth telling an international audience just how this opioid crisis has came about and where we are now. Yeah, so the United States is in the midst of a severe epidemic of opioid addiction. It's important to understand that the people who are dying of opioid overdoses, the vast majority of them are people who are addicted. They're not out there doing this because it's fun. They're using mm -hmm. opioids, either prescription opioids or heroin, because they have to, because they've become hooked. We have an epidemic of opioid addiction in the United States because doctors have been overprescribing pain medication. Beginning in the 1990s, <clears throat> prescriptions for opioids started to soar. And as the prescribing went up, rates of addiction and overdose deaths went up right along with the increase in prescribing. And the reason the medical community started to become so aggressive in our use of these drugs is I believe we were responding in many ways to a multifaceted, brilliant marketing campaign that had been launched mm. originally by one drug company, the maker of OxyContin. Purdue uh, Pharmaceuticals, known, yeah. Yes, known as Purdue in the United States, known as Mundi Pharma in the rest of the world. When that company introduced OxyContin in 1996, it launched this campaign to increase prescribing, a campaign that minimized the risks of these drugs, especially the risk of addiction, and exaggerated the benefits of using them long term. We didn't just hear this directly from the drug company. We were hearing it from pain specialists, eminent in the field mm. of pain medicine. We heard it from our hospitals, our professional societies, from every different direction. Doctors were hearing that if you're compassionate and if you're in the know, you'll be different from those stingy doctors that were under-prescribing. You'll understand that this is the right way to treat pain. And as we responded to this brilliant campaign and as the prescribing increased, it led to a public health catastrophe. Uh, the, the, you've laid out the opioid prescription problem, but what, what perhaps viewers don't know is why, how does heroin um, uh, come, come, become involved here? You obviously were uh, a DE agent. You've been on the streets. You know uh, all about how does an opioid crisis from, the pharma, you know, from pharmaceuticals become a heroin problem? Well, it, it, it's, it's really a supply and demand thing. I mean, basically what happens is, and I'm not a scientist, but I'm a law enforcement officer, but from the heroin perspective, once we begin to see this sort of widespread use coming from pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. and so forth, then what we begin to say is how do we, how do we attack this stuff? What we found out, we were focusing on crack cocaine, uh, cocaine, marijuana, the, the law enforcement rules and procedures were four times higher if you get caught with marijuana or crack cocaine, mm. you, you know, the minimums, the mandatory minimums, where we were sort of putting heroin and, and opioids to the side. One day we looked heroin, up... And, heroin is an opioid. It is an, it? Yeah. It is an opioid. Yeah. And, the, and the bottom was it, it wasn't... We didn't realize the addiction rate that heroin and these opioids were having on people. We was focusing on the crack cocaine and stuff like that. And once we started realizing, it's like, how do we attack this stuff? What do we do to get uh, the public to educate the public, get them to understand? Really, law enforcement, that's really not our, I would say, billywhag. For us to go, it, this is a, what we call a health crisis. It's, you know, when you start talking, even when you're talking about crack or you're talking about mm. opioids, you're talking about something that needs to be a, it's a medical thing. It's not about police. So a lot of our energy and time was being put into going after drug dealers, people, users on the street, how many people thinking this is going to stop it. And we found out we couldn't police our way out of this thing. It just got bigger. I, I, I want to go to uh, Marissa in, in Los Angeles. Um, uh, you are a former heroin addict. You've listened to the conversation here. What's your opinion as, as a former addict of... of uh, do, you, do you feel alone in this, or do you feel that the country is finally taking this seriously? Well, I think that the fact that there's a tension on this is wonderful because now some action actually can be taken. However, from my experience, I have always found it to be a dis-ease of the human spirit.
So it's the fact that there is this void that people are looking to fill. And right at this period of time, it's with heroin and opioids. However, at other times in history, it's been with, you know, like we were just talking about, crack, cocaine, marijuana. You know, some people will fill it with food or sex or gambling. So I really think that it's in addressing the dis-ease of the human spirit and how to kind of survive your emotions. Well, right? I, I, and that it's okay to feel certain feelings and not to go for a drug or a quick fix, not to feel what you're feeling. Uh, okay, I, I saw uh, Dr. Kolodny shaking his head to that. So do you just want to respond, sir? You know, um, people become addicted to opioids by taking them repeatedly. Mm -hmm. And it is true that some people may take opioids repeatedly because they're filling a void or because they're enjoying the effect or they're doing it because a doctor prescribed it mm -hmm. to them. The reason we've seen the number of people addicted to opioids skyrocket is because we've overexposed the population to this highly addictive drug.